Good afternoon, everybody. Hi, hi, hi. You can remain seated. Um, my name is Alain Barker, um, and I'm the president of this amazing and wonderful Rotary Club, the Bloomington Rotary Club. Um, welcome to today's celebration. Uh, today's the 10th of January. Boy, January is already zipping by so fast, I can't believe it. It's also the second day of the semester, so if I forget anything, please forgive me. I'm, I'm in the middle of coordinating a lot of different things in my head right now. Um, I'm very, very happy to be here with you and so excited to see so many people in the room and lots and lots of people online. Um, as usual, I put my the agenda together, I put the program together and I print it out and I come to the meeting expecting to read what I wrote. And as it turns out, everything that I wrote last night and then I saved into the file did not make it to this copy here. So uh, apologies to Peggy Frisbee because she and I had a long conversation about the things that I wanted to tell you about uh, related to the giving, the very, very generous giving that you all were involved in toward the end of last year. So Peggy, I, she's walking in right now looking at me with horror. What, what have I said now? <laughs> um, so my apologies, Peggy, I will be giving all of that information to the club next week with the slides that you and I were in touch with. But there is some uh, information that we want to share with you. Um, I think I can say that we are $2,000 or something like that ahead um, of where we were in previous years on average, so that's really good news. Um, but as um, our, our uh, uh, financial year goes all the way through July 1st, we're sort of midway through a number of projects that we would like to be able to share with you related to the Rotary Foundation, but also to the Bloomington Rotary Club, and that will be coming out um, next week. So for now, um, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Dave Meyer to, um, to offer a reflection. And while Dave's coming up, I just want to be sure that everybody online, Michael, can you hear us well? Is it all good? Great. Okay. Thank you, Alon. Just getting the slide together. Okay, I'd like to offer a reflection on the <clears throat> indigenous people of New Zealand. Uh, America has its Native Americans, and the country of New Zealand has the Maori people. I recently spent a month in New Zealand with New Zealanders who were referred to as Kiwis. Learning about the role of indigenous people and their place in Kiwi life was fascinating, and it contrasted greatly with the U.S. experience with Native Americans. In the Maui, slide two, please. Okay. In the Maui language, New Zealand is called Aotearoa, which means long white cloud. The Maori are Polynesians and migrated to New Zealand several hundred years before Europeans. European descendants are known to the Maori as Pekehe. Uh, today, the Maori make up only, uh, almost 20% of the total New Zealand population. Uh, next slide. The Maori have a prominent place in New Zealand life and culture today. This was not always the case. In 1840, the Treaty of Waitangi was signed to clearly define the rights of Maori, of the Maori under British rule. They were guaranteed property rights and tribal autonomy. The treaty unfortunately did not last, and after 37 years, it was nullified by the British authorities. The Maori were forced to assimilate, and much of their land was confiscated and taken in forced sales. Today, much has changed for the Maori. After substantial civil disobedience in the 1960s and 70s, they regained many of the rights that they had lost. In 1995, the Queen formally apologized to the Maoris and a new treaty was signed that addressed many of the wrongs committed over the years. Now, the original treaty of Waitangi is viewed as a foundational document for the establishment of New Zealand. 
Nearly $1 billion in reparations have been paid by the government to the Maori and significant lands have been returned. Today, the Maori play a prominent part in New Zealand government, business and cultural life. There's a rebirth in the use and study of their language. There are multiple Maori channel, language channels on New Zealand TV. Public signage is increasingly in both English and Maori, even back in the 19th century, way back when. All Maori were awarded the right to vote at the same time as everyone else in New Zealand, men and women. Uh, Maori reserved seats were established in the, in the parliament. Today, it's, there's also a popular movement in New Zealand to rename the country uh, er, uh, or, Orotoa, uh, the land of the long, long cloud, white cloud. Not every, everything is equal uh, between the Maori and the Pekehe, the non-Maori, uh, as Maori life expectancy, health outcomes, and economic conditions are unequal. Nevertheless, nevertheless, the government continues to make progress to address these issues of inequality. Next slide. I'd like to leave you with a performance of the haka by the Black Ferns rugby team, the national women's team. The men and women's national rugby teams perform this traditional dance before each match. It is not a war dance. It is a honor, honor, uh, honor, uh, on a dance to honor uh, large occasions. In fact, the pregame haka ritual has been practiced since 1905 on the men's national rugby team known as the All Blacks. I'll take a second here. It's short, but uh, interesting if you haven't seen a, a haka performed. Uh, while that's happening or not happening, I uh, will point out that I'm wearing a, uh, a, a Maori pendant. This is uh, called a toki, uh, which means it's made of jade and it, is, uh, uh, it means uh, strength and competence. And it is often worn by, it's typically worn by tribal chiefs, but it is okay for non Maori to wear it. So. Okay, we will go without the haka, but if you could imagine people dancing and shouting, some of you have seen it. Uh, I cannot, I cannot. I, I, I know only a few words of Maori, but anyway, thank you all. Oh, I have it. Okay. Uh, indeed. This was done at the World Cup uh, that just completed, was, uh, completed just as we arrived in New Zealand in November. Honor the great occasion of the
in this case, it was the Australian national team that received the packet from the uh, New Zealand national women team. The Haka. You've seen the Haka. If you've not seen one before, thank you. And that probably explains many of the uh, the wins that they get, because <laughs> I would imagine facing that group after high, that is a little daunting. Oh wow, fantastic! Well, thank you, Dave. Thank you so much. And and again, it's so great to have you back after such a, an amazing trip that you took. Okay, we have a few um, celebrations here. Um, birthday to begin with. Hank Walter, happy birthday, January 11th. So that's tomorrow. If you want to jump on Facebook, you can wish him a happy birthday. Um, member anniversaries. Kyla Cox Deckard, our reporter for the month. Um, 11 years. Uh, we have Scott Shackelford, five years, and Jim Shea, 11 years. So let's thank them all for being part of the club. It's really great, what amazing people, each one of them. Um, okay, we have our introduction of the guests, and I want to say this is a very special day because we also have two, three new members that we're going to be uh, welcoming to the club. So Tracy Jovanovich, um, you can come. Would you like to do it from there? Well, the problem is that they, you have to look at the micro, the uh, camera from there. So you can have a choice of either doing it there or up here. So, so okay, and. I want to be sure that I'm pronouncing the last name correctly. Is it Jovanovic or Jovanovic? Jovanovic. Okay, great. Tracy, welcome. I, I tried to get him to take my name. He said no. So what can I say? <laughs> no offense, Dad. Um, anyway, we, are, uh, we have three sets of guests here today. And uh, our first guest, if you please stand, Kristen Russ, a guest of Liz Feidel. And Kristen uh, works with New Leaf Landscape Design. Yep. And then Mr. Bright is uh, double dating over here. He's got two guests. He's got uh, Michelle Cole. Michelle, if you would stand. Mm -hmm. Michelle's an IT consultant. Welcome. And then Madison Ferguson. Madison's an IE student. And not only is she an IE student, she is one of four finalists for the Rotary Grant Scholarship. So, and that is a $40,000 scholarship. So, welcome. Great. Welcome. Welcome, everybody. Um, Michael, do we have some people online? We do not. We're just uh, just all Rotarians. Okay. It's great to see you in, uh, in the Zoom space. My goodness. Not Joy. Joy is here. Let's all thank you. Welcome, Joy. For all the, the many, many, many weeks that Joy has anchored the Zoom session. Thank you so much, and thank you for being here. It's really wonderful to see you. Okay, well, here comes the, uh, the, the one of the very fun parts, not the only, but one of the very fun parts. Um, we have new members to induct. So if, if everybody who's related to that group would like to come up, Jeff Richardson, Tracy Ivanovich, and our new members, um, that would be fantastic. And Aaron Davis is coming up as well. Great, everybody. Let's see, come on up, Jeff. So I think what we'll do is we'll have everybody stand here. Okay. Like this. So then really and then Jeff and I'll stand here. So stand there, but if, if the new members are there, and their sponsors. sponsors can mm -hmm. stand over here, it would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, You're a unique new member. Yeah. 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 We have to make space for us. Okay, good. All right, it's a busy afternoon. The, as you can tell by the uh, amount of people in the tables, we're growing. And so super excited to have all our new members here. Uh, we have Michelle Cohen, who's sponsored by Dave Avery, who's actually a transfer just coming over formally from Brown County. And um, we welcome Michelle as she's transferring. Uh, she serves as executive director of the nonprofit Lake Monroe Water Fund. Uh, Fund. She previously led the Indiana Recycling Coalition, and prior to that, she lived in Brown County and directed Brown County 
Solid Waste Management District, overseeing the construction and operation of the Recycling Center. She grew up in Northeast Ohio and earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Biology and English from Wittenberg University in Springfield, Ohio. She holds a Master of Science in Environmental Science degree from the O'Neill, yay, School of Public and Environmental Affairs at IU Bloomington. Uh, she is a former member of the Brown County Rotary Club and served as its president in 2000 and 2001. She's been on several other boards over the years, including the Blue Ridge Neighborhood Association and Marlin Elementary PTO, and is currently on the board of Jade Design. Michelle enjoys, be, enjoys being in a book club, traveling, meeting new people, and spending time outdoors. She and her husband, Chuck, have lived in Bloomington for 18 years and have two teenage sons and one middle-aged dog. Welcome, Michelle. <laughs> Next, we have Roy Graham, sponsored by Aaron Davis. Roy is the middle child of three, uh, three children born to Rita and Austin Graham, who are no longer with us. His sister is an occupational therapist, and his brother is a retired professional musician and a high-level computer programmer. Roy studied music from a young age and first took interest in the drum set and later in all percussion instruments. Instead of pursuing his earlier interest in medicine, he changed course and at the age of 19 attended Indiana University Bloomington to study percussion with George Gaber, the most sought out master of percussion in the country. Roy left IU for, after about two years and worked for the Ashram Bakery for a year, but soon returned to private music studies and piano with Paul Worth studying the famous Hoffman arm weight technique. And to this day plays and composes his own classical music in the spirit of Frederick Chopin. He then owned a successful scratch bakery, The Busy Bee, for almost three years from 1980 to 1983, and returned to study law at IU, earning his JD and his license to practice in Indiana in 1991. He still practices criminal law and has completed five novels, four, four in a series, and is actively seeking an agent, if you know anyone. Mm -hmm. All right, welcome, Lori. <clears throat> and finally, we have Jillian Rich, who is sponsored by Connie Shackless. Jillian is a successful business owner and dog trainer based in Bloomington, Indiana. She opened Bannard Mutt's Training, a dog training business in 2018 after graduating from the Tom Rose School for Professional Drug Dog Trainers. In addition to her thriving business, she's also the founder and executive director of Bannard Mutt's Rescue, a nonprofit dog rescue organization that focuses on training. Jillian has been married to her high school sweetheart, Casey Rich, since 2016. They welcomed their daughter, Lorelai, in October 2022, and currently live in Bloomington with their three dogs, Dixie, Phoebe, and Felix. I hope you're equally able to train children. <laughs> in her free time, Jillian enjoys staying active and is a member of CrossFit Bloomington and takes ballroom dancing classes with her wife at Arthur Murray Dance. She's also been a vegan since 2017. She competes in dock diving at a national level with her dog, Dixie, and in 2020 and 2022, Dixie was the top in her breed for North American diving dogs. In 2021, Jillian and Dixie were contestants on season three of America's Top Dog on A&E. Before starting her own business and family, Jillian graduated from the University of Tampa in 2017, where she studied classical voice. She was born in Sarasota, Florida, and has always had a passion for animals, particularly dogs. With her strong education and training background, she's been able to build a successful career helping both dogs and their owners. Very, very varietal team up here. So, Jeff, if you would do the induction, please. So, Roy, Jillian, and Michelle, on behalf of the board and the membership of the Bloomington Rotary Club, it is a great pleasure to welcome you as our newest members of our club. We look forward to the fellowship that you, you will share, as well as your participation in many club projects that make our community, country, and world a better place. Through Rotary, though Rotary is not a political organization, Rotarians are vitally concerned with good citizenship and the election of strong leaders to public office. While Rotary is not a religious organization, it is built on those eternal principles that have served as a moral compass for people throughout the ages. Rotary is an organization of business and professional people pledged to uphold the highest ethical and moral standards. Rotarians believe that worldwide fellowship and peace can be achieved when people unite with the Rotary model of service above self. Rotary activities exemplify the charity and sacrifice that one would expect from people who believe that they have a responsibility to help others. 
Roy, Jillian, Michelle, you have been chosen for membership in the Bloomington Club because your fellow members believe you to be a leader in our community and because you possess the qualities to champion the message and principles of Rotary. You are a representative of your vocation within our club and community. You now become an ambassador of Bloomington Rotary, carrying the ideals of service to all within your sphere of influence. Our community will know and judge Rotary by your character and service. We will also look to you for inspiration as we strive to become better Rotarians. We will now pin you with the distinguished badge of a Rotarian, your Rotary pin. We ask that you wear your Rotary pin with pride, not only to all Rotary functions, but to your many endeavors as a symbol of your commitment to Rotary ideals and your recognition of your contribution toward a better world. Fellow Rotarians, please rise and welcome our newest members, Roy, Jillian, and Michelle. Uh, don't leave yet, folks. We're going to take a few photos yeah. here. This gives the three of them another round of applause. Congratulations. Yeah. Okay. So we have a we have a few lunch, uh, a few excuse me, a few club updates, uh, which I want to be mentioning in front of you here. Teresa is going to be joining me if you'd like to come up now, as well as Leslie if you want to come up here. Um, so we have the lunch buddies program on your tables, and we will be sharing this with everybody online as well. Um, this is really one of the fun things where we meet, uh, we go out to lunch, go out to coffee, maybe hang out, go to a movie with another member of the club, hopefully somebody that you've not met before, or if you've met that person before, absolutely, spend some time with them. Um, but we, we, this is something that I constantly get people writing um, emails to me about, about how amazing it was to sit with this member um, over a period of lunchtime or what have you, and chat about all things Rotary and all things between the two lives that they share. So this is something that we really, really love doing as a club. And I urge you all to take advantage of that. Um, the, the list is there in front of you. I'm, I'm eager to see who I'm gonna be having lunch with in the next quarter. We have Teresa Clare, who's gonna be talking about Hoosier Hills Food Bank. So last February, before I was even a member of Rotary, I was able to volunteer at the Hoosier Hills Food Bank with my son and other Rotarians. It was a great introduction to the service that a Rotary does. So I was asked to uh, spearhead the uh, volunteer day at Hoosier Hills Food Bank. And so we are going to, to do that on Tuesday, February 28th. So mark your calendars. We will be sending out a link for registration. There'll be two shifts, the uh, 4 to 5.30 p.m. and 5.30 to 7 p.m. So uh, please, uh, rent, when you see the link uh, in your email, please register. Uh, we'll be packing, uh, they weren't specific as to what we would be doing, but it'll be something to do with packing food. So last year we were packing Cheerios in, in bags and, sealing, and, and preparing those for other uh, food distributions throughout the community. Um, and then there's other, other things to do with food that we might be doing. So uh, we're, we weren't sure about that. Um, only uh, conditions, no uh, closed toe, uh, wear closed toed shoes, no sandals or flip flops, dress for the weather, the uh, warehouse doors might be, might be open. But uh, yeah, hope, hope uh, to see you uh, signing up and uh, um, we'll, there'll be uh, 12 uh, spots per uh, shift and uh, kids 12 and up can join us as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Teresa. And, you know, I, I want to mention that Teresa is a new member of the club. 
Uh, Tracy Yunovanovich is a new member of the club. Isn't it great to see new members of the club stand up and, and take, take the leadership of, of our amazing organizations in different ways. So, uh, but we have past president, Leslie Green, joining us to talk about another great initiative here. Speaking of all members of the club. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, I would, real quickly, because I know we're gonna get to today's program. I spoke with you a couple of months ago about the Zero Land Project. That's an opportunity for all of us to join together in a, an effort to decrease our carbon footprint. Uh, it's, a, it's a city of Bloomington initiative, but you need not live in the city of Bloomington to participate. So I'm hoping many of us will sign up and sign on as your household. And to sign on, you would need to have your utility bills, which for me the hardest thing is remembering how to get into my Duke account. Um, so you need your utility bills, electric, uh, gas. You need to know how, about what your, how much you drive a year and how many miles per gallon your car gets. But you put all this information into the, uh, to the website and we'll put it in, the, in the, this week's edition of the roundabout. You put all your information in there and it not only registers you for that, but it tells you kind of how you compare to the rest of the city of Bloomington and to Indiana. And uh, we will not be having a competition, which I announced earlier, but we will be having a community group. So we'll invite you to join the Rotary community group as part of this and to participate in various challenges in the next six months or so. We're doing this with the other two Rotary clubs. We hope to have at least 30 people I think we could get 30 out of this club alone. So uh, just think of the difference you'll make in the environment in our community, our state and our world. So I hope you'll join. Thanks. Thank you so much, Leslie. And uh, just to let you know, I did register. I went online and I did everything and I was able to find all the information um, and it's definitely worth it because now I'm that much more aware of the energy that we are consuming in, in our household. Um, I want to uh, quickly remind you about the Busco Chimney Theatre special event that's happening on January 19th. That's next Thursday, the 19th. Um, the, Black, the, the Black Opry Review Tour is coming to town. For me, this is something very special because, as I mentioned last week, country music um, has been sort of co-opted into a sort of a white lens. And there's a lot of discussion around the country now about how diverse country music really is and how the origins of country music are based in uh, many of the, the black musical traditions that exist here in the country. So if you wanna have fun with a group of Rotarians next Thursday and learn more about an amazing genre of music and have some fun at the beautiful Buscope Chumley Theater, um, please uh, look at your roundabout and just um, join us next Thursday. I will be there. I've got my tickets for myself and my wife, Liz, and I hope that many of you will join us there. I'm going back to um, a bit of housekeeping from and huge thanks for before the end of the year, the, the bell ringing. I just want to read out the names of those who were involved. There was a fabulous project uh, led by Steve Mobley. Um, and so the people who were involved were Vivian Bridges, Phil Eskew, and Anne Eskew, Hank Hengeba, uh, Rex Hillary, Tracy Yovanovich, Yovanovich, Erica Kovacs, Sarah Laughlin, Steve Mobley, Chris Michael uh, Morrison, Bill Murphy, Art Omic, Jerry Pajak, and his friend Mariette, uh, and then Jim Shea, Wilson Shindell, Tina Swanson, and Jeff Tina. So let's thank them all for having participated in that project. Okay, so I think that we're on to our program for the day. Before we get there, I just want to thank Winston Shindell once again for greeting. Introductions by Tracy, thank you so much. Michael, thank you for being online as our host. Dave Meyer for your reflection. Kyla cox Deckard for being our reporter for the month. Teresa Clare and uh, for her, she's going to be um, operating Zoom, Mike. I think that that's, oh, not really because we're not doing um, teachers, we're not doing uh, 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 happy dollars. So I think it's fine. Um, and then Tyler Nichols. Um, but Teresa, thank you very much for introducing our guest. So my son, Nicholas, uh, came home from his first day at Ivy Tech uh, as a student last year, raving about his famous astronomy professor who interviews celebrities on his YouTube channel. 
I was skeptical. I was a little skeptical of all the things that he told me about this professor. So I had to do a Google search on him. And I was amazed that everything that he said was true. My, <laughs> my, my son continued to brag about this favorite professor throughout the semester. So I'm truly honored to introduce that man today. Kurt Messick is currently on faculty at Ivy Tech Community College teaching astronomy and earth science and has served as chaplain at Bell Trace Retirement Community for the past 24 years. Prior to this, he served for a decade as a professor of philosophy and religious studies at the American Military University based in West Virginia. He has uh, more degrees than he will tell me, but he has degrees from AMU, Indiana University, Oxford, University of London, Swinburne University in Australia, South Africa Theological Seminary, and currently studying at Vanderbilt University, finishing a doctorate in chaplaincy. After arriving home from Iceland just 12 hours ago, Father Messick is here today to discuss the James Webb Telescope and other astronomy tidbits. So please welcome Father Kurt Messick. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll get the technology going here, I hope. Uh, I did bring up my hat because nobody knows me without the hat. Um, in Iceland, you don't have last names, you have patronyms. So I wouldn't be Kurt Messick, I would be Kurt Geraldson, Kurt, son of Jerry. But the tour agencies don't put my last name down as Geraldson. I'm Kurt with the hat. <laughs> I show up at passport control and they say, oh, you've been here before. Then I leave and they say, you've been here too long, where's your visa? Uh, <laughs> that actually happened to me on the way there, flip, 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 you've been here a lot. Yes, it looks like a drug dealer. No, no, no. I just, I just smuggle DVDs, that's all. Um, but, but, but yes, uh, I, I am uh, 33 years with uh, Ivy Tech. I'm 24 years with uh, Bell Trace, uh, I, I uh, worked with Joy for many, many years, so I'm happy to see her here as well. Um, and uh, uh, yes, I, I was very, very uh, intentional at making sure I got home with enough time to sleep just a bit, found my basement had flooded uh, and, and all sorts of wonderful stuff. So the water is off and I'm not gonna worry about it until after this. Uh, so, so, so yes, if any of you have any concerns about like fixing a basement, see me afterwards. Uh, but, but, but yeah, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert that I'm not. I'm, I'm actually not a James Webb expert. I'm not a telescope expert. I am a, a science educator. So I know a little bit about a lot of things. And that's sort of been my entire uh, history. I've been, uh, that's why I have as many degrees as I have. The reason I don't tell people how many degrees I have, I, I, I have a Jewish study certificate from IU and I read a story in the process of doing that about a rabbi who said, you should always have at least one book that you haven't bought that you want and never count the books you have. And I've been doing that with my degrees. I have my next three degrees after Vanderbilt already lined up. Uh, so if anyone wants to, uh, there, I heard there's a scholarship somewhere. <laughs> so, 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 but yes, James, James Webb Telescope. Uh, as, as I mentioned, I'm gonna go through these very quickly. I just got back from Iceland and no, my arms are not tired. Uh, so so that's, that's a hackneyed joke. And I used to be a comedian, you'll see that in a minute. Um, you know, I used to be, that's why the jokes aren't funny. Uh, <laughs> the, the, this is Geyser, uh, named Geyser because it's a geyser. Um, I got this shot. This is one of the best shots I've gotten in several years. I go to Iceland three or four times, two or three times a year. Um, notice the moon inside the sculpture. This is called the Sun Voyager. So I thought it was a little bit ironic. I posted it up in an Iceland uh, uh, picture sharing area and it's gotten like viral response. Um, here is the sun at noon on the South Coast by Vic. Uh, the sun sort of comes up, skirts along the <laughs> horizon and then goes down and says, fooled you. Uh, so on the south coast, you get sun for four hours a day. On the north coast, you get it for two hours a day at this time of year. Uh, last year, I went for the volcano. Uh, Iceland, whenever they're having a, an economic problem, they push a button and it sets off a volcano and all the tourists come flocking. 
That happened in 2009. You may remember the volcano, no one could pronounce. Uh, so if you can't pronounce it, just remember it's called volcano. I uh, yellow <laughs> yogurt. If you can't get that, just say, I love yellow yogurt. This one, however, is not that one. Uh, there, my mother always said when I took pictures like this, that looks like a postcard. How do I know you were there? So <laughs> for my mother. So, and I went for the Northern Lights, again, astronomy. Uh, I don't know if you can lower the lights just a little bit, but make it show up better. This isn't the best picture of the Northern Lights ever, but you, if you look very closely, you'll notice the Big Dipper in the background. I was able to capture, capture that there. Uh, among other things I've done, I used to work for a woman named Margaret Thatcher. You can praise me or blame me later. Uh, here I was being interviewed when she passed away. Um, I now work at Ivy Tech, as you've heard. I'm chaplain at uh, Bell Trace, as you've heard. I actually, uh, people say, how did you get your call? Well, I got my call on the telephone. Uh, a friend of mine's mother moved in right after they opened the facility, and he said, there's a room downstairs with the word chapel on it, but no one's doing anything. Have you ever thought of a place like Bell Trace? And my snap response was, no, of course not. I went and I've been there ever since. Uh, and in, in honor of one of your uh, members here, and another reason why I wore the hat, I have been properly ordained in various traditions, <laughs> including the Order of the Hat uh, by, by Charlotte. Um, before I went to seminary, I was a member of Trinity downtown. Uh, I'm not officially Episcopalian because I'm dyslexic and can't spell it, uh, but, but I am an independent Anglican, if I'm anything, but I'm a little bit of everything along the way. Uh, as I mentioned, I am a stand-up comic now and then. I used to run the show at Bear's Place. Um, I, I had a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame until they took the letters off. Um, so so, so all, all, all sorts of fun stuff there. And I use this to try to liven my classes uh, that, that you've already heard, heard about uh, because anyone can just sit in front of a Zoom and, and zone out or just throw up PowerPoints. Notice the lack of words in my PowerPoints so far. I try to do that because again, I'm dyslexic, so I can't read either. Uh, but, but, but yeah, it, it's sort of interesting. I, I, I figured out that a lot of celebrities were stuck at home uh, doing nothing as well. A couple of them even said, well, I'm just stuck at home, so why not talk to Kurt's class? Uh, it may include Henry Winkler, Dolph Lundgren. If you've ever watched Rocky IV, I must break you. So he has a master's degree in chemical engineering, so talking to my science class was right. Oh, and John Cleese wanted to study at science, science at Cambridge. He actually quoted uh, historians of, of philosophy and history and of science in his comedy routine. Only guy I've ever known to do that. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I, I incorporated it in there. You take my classes, you could, there's still time to sign up. We don't start until next week. Uh, just, uh, oh, I'm not supposed to be plugging up here. Okay, uh, but, but Snoop Dogg will tell you to read the syllabus and then we go from there. Uh, I'm going to talk about the James Webb and in, in relation to other uh, 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 telescopes. Of course, the one it's always compared to is the Hubble. The Hubble took a long time to build, uh, a, 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 as you can see, but it did all come together eventually. Um, the, the Hubble was designed to last 10 to 20 years. We've had it 30 two years now going uh, or, or so. so. So when NASA gets it right, they get it really, really right. Uh, when they don't, things crash and burn. Uh, they have actually more than one Hubble. Most people don't realize that. When you're going to manufacture something like this, why are you only going to make one? Uh, so the other one is actually hanging in the Smithsonian. Uh, there, there I am in front of the, the mirror. I weighed too much there, I hate that photo. Uh, here I am with the mock-up of the additional parts. And it was a good thing they did this because the Hubble had an out of shape mirror when it was first launched. They had to go to the other one here to help diagnose and figure out how to fix it. So they built what's effectively a big contact lens, stuck it in the, the uh, uh, telescope several years later, and it's worked like a dream ever since. One of the things that was noted on the James Webb is that if that same thing happened with the Webb, when it got up there, we didn't have the capability to go up and fix it. So it had to work right the first time. The Hubble is only a couple hundred miles above the surface. The James Webb telescope is a million mile or a, a, a million miles away from us, 1.5 million kilometers 
All right. The Hubble, just for sort of size comparison uh, for your sort of daily life and work, here, here we have that. There, this shows you the mirror size of an upgrade. So we're getting a little bit better in terms of light collection. It's not magnification. I, I, I know size matters for those of you who are fans of Freud and the Kinsey Institute, but uh, 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 it, 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 it's uh, uh, not just magnification, it's light collecting ability here. And the James Webb, as you can see, is, uh, uh, is, is remarkable, not just in the size, though, but in the construction of the materials that we have. Uh, here you can see a size uh, comparison with the people around it as it was being built. This is the platform for the James Webb. But the James Webb is often thought to be the successor to the Hubble. It's actually more the successor to a, a, a now defunct uh, telescope called the Spitzer. And that's because the Spitzer is an infrared telescope and the James Webb is predominantly infrared. Uh, the Hubble is only somewhat infrared, it's mostly visual light. Uh, and the reason why it is an infrared is because infrared is blocked less by gas and dust and other things in the universe as the light's getting to us. The, the, the waves are, are longer and the longer a wave, the more likely it is to get to us. This is a good book I can recommend on the Spitzer. And believe it or not, it's a science book that isn't necessarily boring. Uh, so I, I do recommend it. Telescopes have been around for a little over 400 years. Here I am in Bath, England. Uh, they don't have a town named Shower, but they do have a town named Bath. Uh, I, I know the bad jokes, I'm sorry, you, you, you get what you pay for. What was the admission cost here? Uh, here? Uh, so, so, so yeah, if the jokes aren't very good, now you know why I'm a professor and a chaplain. Uh, this, this is the, the mock-up of the uh, telescope that William Herschel used to discover Uranus, not Uranus. It's Uranus on the Bob and Tom show. It's Uranus everywhere else. Um, be prepared for lots and lots and lots of bad jokes because in NASA's decadal study, they have approved a probe to Uranus. <laughs> uh, I am not making that up. That, 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 that is real stuff. This was the first time anyone had ever discovered a planet in history. Think about it. Until this point, from prehistoric times, everyone had seen Venus, everyone had seen Mars, everyone had seen Jupiter and Saturn, everyone had seen Mercury. No one had seen a planet before. William Herschel found this planet and said, ah, I love this, I'm going to name you George. <laughs> Uh, and, and, and yes, I mean, uh, because George, King George, we know him as George III, wonderful guy. Uh, he has a great part in Hamilton. Uh, he is, uh, uh, the rest of the Europeans said, no, I don't think we like George that much. Uh, so it became the butt of jokes. Uh, Uranus. Uh, of course, what does an astronomer really do? <laughs> I love this, especially the goggles. Notice the goggles on the guy there. Uh, there is space right there. Well, you're all in it. You're all in it right now. Go to my YouTube channel. You'll see John Lovitz, the comedian uh, John Lovitz, telling you if you want to be an astronomer, just go outside and look up. You're in space already. Uh, so, so here I am with one of my own telescopes, a little smaller than the Hubble, a little smaller than the James Webb uh, there. This shows you a little bit of the size uh, 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 the distance proportions there. Hubble, again, is only a couple hundred miles up. It goes around the world about once every hour and a half or so. Uh, the, the web is, you can see, is four times further out from the moon. It's at what is called a Lagrange point, which means it's orbiting the sun outside of our orbit along with us. Uh, every three body system has Lagrange points, and you'll notice L1, 2, and 3. Those are pretty stable areas where not a lot is going to jostle a vessel that's going to be there. Notice L2 is on the outside of the system. That way we can have a, a view of the universe without going through the sun. Almost everything in the universe, you want to collect more light. The two things you do not want to do that with too is the sun and the moon. You want to limit the light. Otherwise, you end up with uh, burned retinas or moon eye. It's a real thing, moon eye uh, there. Again, the Spitzer, as I mentioned, is, is probably more appropriately the forerunner of the, the James Webb, but uh, we're, we're getting larger and larger as we go along. The Spitzer was also an infrared, which meant it needed to be super cooled. How do you super cool something like the James Webb when it's just sort of out there? Well, you always have it aimed away from the sun. 
and you have cooling devices on the far side that will take the heat away from the sensors. On one side, it's literally hot enough to boil water. On the other side, it's literally hot enough to freeze nitrogen or cool enough to freeze nitrogen. There is that much of a difference between the two, but we get it down to minus 233 Celsius. I mean, really, really low that's out there. You can see as they were doing aperture checks, some of the images that you probably saw as they were announcing things just when it was being opened, uh, that before they had the original first official uh, images come through, they were doing all sorts of aperture checks. And depending upon how you are positioning the mirrors and, and having them work together, you get different kinds of uh, images that come through. So when we look at these, here's the Spitzer and here's the web in a test. And you can notice just how different it is. And notice the spikiness of the stars. That's an artifact of the telescope rather than the star itself. If you look at Hubble images of this, you'll notice it has four spikes. Uh, with the uh, James Webb, we have usually six prominent and two smaller spikes. So you can say six or eight, depending on which way you want to do. Here's the Southern Ring Nebula, side by side, Hubble and James Webb. The Hubble was always the most remarkable things. Now people are like, oh my goodness, we didn't know what we were missing. This is part of the history of astronomy. For a very, very long time, we didn't know what we were missing. Each new advance shows us what we were missing. Uh, think about just the 1800s. Who knew about radio waves? Who knew about uh, ultraviolet and infrared and how to collect those kinds of things? The, you know, the way uh, infrared was discovered, same guy, William Herschel, uh, who discovered Uranus, not Uranus. Uh, he was taking light and breaking it apart into the rainbow spectrum. And notice that a glass of water a little over here outside of the light was heating up for no apparent reason. And he figured out there was light he couldn't see that was energizing the water. Sometimes it's just that simple. Sometimes it's much more complex. The James Webb Telescope started its design process while the Hubble was being deployed. It took that long. NASA things often take that long. The, uh, the, the probe to Pluto recently. How many of you are team Pluto? You still want it to be a planet? Yes. I belong to a Facebook group. When I was your age, Pluto was a planet. You can all join with me. Uh, it was discovered in 1930, so my grandmother could have belonged to a Facebook group. When I was your age, we didn't know the damn thing existed. Uh, so, so it, it, but, but uh, we made it to Pluto with the New Horizons probe in 2015. The planning for that started in 1988. Planning, funding, building, launching, getting there took that long. Uh, so, so sometimes things take a very long time and they're, they're, they're worth the wait. Of course, when we launched the probe, Pluto was still a planet. And then by the time we got there, oh, sorry, we'll turn around. We don't need you anymore. Uh, here's another side-by-side -side comparison. This is from the, the Carina, uh, uh, Carina Nebula. A nebula is a, an area of gas and dust. A planetary nebula, let me go back here for a moment, is usually almost always a solitary star that is in the process of dying. And as it is going out, it is puffing out its gases and turns into something that I liken to a Fabergé egg. Uh, other uh, nebulae out there are often vast expanses of gas and dust that take in hundreds, thousands, sometimes millions of stars. And these are stellar factories. And this is what we have in the Carina. And you can see so many more stars that are appearing in the gas itself from the James Webb. Uh, we have the near can, we have near can, and, uh, which, is, which is near infrared, and then there's medium wave infrared. There are multiple cameras that are deployed on this here. Here we have a cluster of galaxies uh, within a southern constellation. Uh, you can see again on, on the left, uh, we, over there we have the Hubble image and then over on the right. Notice one of the things that's happening here. We have, have that happening there. there, there there's gravitational uh, uh, forces at work there. The light that's coming through is being bent around something. 
uh, what is that something. Sometimes we can't determine what that something is, and that we call dark matter. Because we know it's there, but we can't tell what it is directly. We can only tell indirectly what's there by the effect it's having on other things. So just as we, William Herschel didn't know what the infrared waves were that were heating up the glass, but he knew the glass was getting hotter, something was there, let's go find out. One of the objects of the James Webb, one of the things we're hoping for, is to give us new evidence to help us detect what dark matter is. Also, there's this thing out there called dark energy, and you know, we, we get that every four years during presidential politics. Uh, <laughs> between the astronomers are looking for it off the planet too. So that's a, that's a bipartisan joke. I can use that for any, I can use that for any party. Um, uh, Multi-party actually, I don't want to leave the others out. Uh, uh, but but uh, most of the universe is comprised of dark energy and dark matter. And we have no idea what it is. And we only can just begin to tell that it's making an impact on what we're seeing that's out there. This is Stephen's quintet. Uh, quintet means five, and you're looking at it and saying, there are only four there, so good for you for counting. Uh, the, the fifth one is a little bit off screen, and it's almost always outside of the view of, of any telescope. You have to stitch together the images. So, so, so uh, notice the complexity that we're seeing inside of the galaxies more directly with the web image that's there. That's really what we're trying to do and see these are the pillars of creation. This is from the Eagle Nebula. And the one on the left is perhaps one of the most famous of Hubble's images. So it makes sense that this would be one of the first ones that we would want to focus on when we were doing the James Webb. Notice the difference of structures. What's happening inside of those sort of talons, because if you look at the larger nebula, it looks like an eagle with its wings spread out. And these are the talons are sort of right in the middle there. Inside are stars that are forming. And we can peer through the gas and dust even more directly with the James Webb to see those thousands of stars. This is six to 7,000 light years away from us. Uh, so, so what's going to be happening is it will be disintegrating as a gas structure and turning into a cluster of stars. Here again, we see the comparison Hubble and Webb. And this shows you sort of how we get the light diffraction, the spikiness that's happening there. And I'll, I'll, one of the things I do, this is sort of my, my, my closing. So I am, I am coming up to time here, I know. Uh, see, uh, in comedy, they shine a light in your face and then they open a trap door and all, all sorts of stuff. Get off the stage! Uh, uh, I teach solar system astronomy as my primary class at Ivy Tech. So is the James Webb just good for things far away? No. Titan. Titan is one of the most likely places in our solar system for life. When I took Astronomy 101 here at IU way back in 1985, we had like one sentence in one book, well, we might find planets around other stars and we might have life somewhere in the universe. Well, now we can get an entire degree in astrobiology. This is one of the top five places in the solar system that might have life. And we can actually see clouds and falls and lakes and streams, but they're not H2O, they're methane and ethane. But the things you need for life are energy, liquid and carbon. Well, no one said the liquid has to be water. This could be it. We've actually landed something on it before with the Cassini probe. Here's Jupiter, probably in a way you've not seen it before. This is an infrared. Notice we can actually track storm cells and other things from the Earth. We don't actually have to go to the Juno probe, which does really great work. But we can do this from the Earth. You can see the aurora up and down. And I like this one here. We can finally see the rings directly from the Earth. Jupiter has rings. All the gas giants have rings. And then this, you could be forgiven if you thought this was a James Webb image of Saturn. Uh, this is Neptune. Neptune also has rings. 
We've only ever been to Uranus once. We've only ever been to Neptune once. That was Voyager 2. We've never been back to either of them. And of course, the cameras, imagine your cell phone. Every time you get a new cell phone, it has a better camera. These were cameras from the 80s, <laughs> actually from the 70s that we sent up there. Now we can almost see what we saw close up just with the James Webb that's there. So this shows the reach further and further out. And we're getting closer and closer to the moments of creation with the James Webb. How's that for timing? <laughs> Yes, yes. Maybe, uh, take one from here and one from the web. Okay, well, we'll, 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 we'll see if I know how to take one from the web. Uh, but yes. Uh, question, I see a hand up in the back. Can you take one from the hole and one from the Just for clarification, the Hubble, what we see is visual light. Yes. And the web, what we see is infrared. Infrared, sort of, if you think about music, it's like, okay, I can't sing that high, transpose it down. What we're doing is we're taking the infrared effectively and transposing it into what it would look like if it were, big. yes, yes. Roy G. Biv, yes, you've probably met him once or twice. Yes. Anybody from the Zoom call? Looks like everybody's silent. That, that's okay. Well, that's we're, okay. We're at 1 p.m. Would you mind staying for a little bit? To I, I, questions? I can, that's yes. Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Kurt. Yes. That was incredible. <laughs> but once again, a reminder that the programming at this Bloomington Rotary Club is totally spectacular. We could spend another three hours with you, um, but although you do have to sleep. And, and so, go, and. Go to my YouTube channel, please. I need to. And one funny thing that Charlotte did say was when you were talking about the number of years that it takes for NASA to develop projects, she was saying, she was saying, well, you should try a street in Bloomington and see how long that takes. <laughs> so, um, so thank you so much. And we, we um, support an organization every quarter in, um, in honor of our guests and Pets Alive is receiving support, support from the Bloomington Rotary Club. Thanks to you and for, for your time with us. Um, so next week, um, we will be uh, here, we'll be here in the Georgian room. No, 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 we'll be in the Georgian room. Apologies for the confusion about where we were going to be today. In the Georgian room, our guest will be, guess who from? Uh, Justin Garcia from the Kinsey Institute. From the Kinsey Institute. So we'll have a different perspective on things from the Kinsey Institute next, next week. He's also the Ruth N. Halls professor and IU, uh, at IU and is adjunct professor at the IU School of Medicine. So that should be really fabulous. Uh, looking forward to seeing you all there. Uh, with that, let's share the four-way test plus one of the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? And fifth, is it fun? Thanks to Joy. Thank you all so much. That was great. That was excellent.